Hi, it's Morag Gamble. Welcome to Masterclass number 28. The topic that we're going to be exploring today is what is permaculture in a changing world and how can it help us to respond to all the multiple crises that we're facing. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also to First Nations peoples everywhere. I also acknowledge that this land was never ceded and that we now have much to learn about how to listen to the land and thrive here regeneratively. So this series of masterclasses that I bring to you every month are put together by my three organisations. So that's the Permaculture Education Institute, our Permaculture Life and the Ethos Foundation. So Permaculture Education Institute is the teacher's program. Our Permaculture Life is where you'll find all the things around um, the blog and the YouTube and permaculture gardening. And the Ethos Foundation is a registered permaculture charity that supports permaculture education around the world. So welcome to those of you who are here as part of any of those programs. And also welcome to those of you who are here for the very first time. It's wonderful to have your company here today. We have Uh, well over two and a half thousand people registered for this masterclass. So I'm really delighted. Just so you know, I have actually pre-recorded this session today just because I'm worried about my internet connectivity and that it might drop out. So, but I am here live with you and I'm available to chat in the chat box. So open that up and I invite you now also to introduce yourself and where you're from and to be in conversation with me throughout this session. So what is permaculture in a changing world? We've seen overlapping and cascading crises happening in particularly in this last year. Climate change is continuing. Uh, We're not on track for under 1.5 degrees and COVID doesn't seem to have slowed down climate change. We've had a little bit of a, a lessening, but really not significant enough. We've also seen an increase in in bushfires and storms and flooding. Last season, as we know here in Australia, we had um, unprecedented bushfires and 12.6 million hectares burned um, and a conservative estimate of 1.1 billion animals were killed, um, maybe 240 billion invertebrates. Of course, these are all guesses, but this is the best guess that people could come up with. The Californian fires are bigger and faster, three times bigger than usual. The Amazon is burning again, uh, bigger than last year. Uh, And the Arctic is burning too, 35% more than last year. And the estimates are that almost 150 million people will be hit by floods by the end of 2020, which cause landslides, erosion, disruption, um, homelessness. So the, the crises that we're facing are enormous and our ecological footprint continues to grow. Um, the studies, the ecological footprint studies show that we overshot the capacity of the earth to support us around about August 22nd this year. So everything that happens from now until the end of the year is eating into future budgets, future generation budgets, ecological systems budgets. We've got the COVID pandemic, um, which over a million people have lost their lives to. We have a growing hunger pandemic, uh, The estimates are 25,000 people a day die from hunger and 10,000 of those are children. Yet we have also this crazy system where at least half of the food that is grown is wasted. The thing about the wasted food is that it it squanders seeds and soil and water, forests, labour and capital. And we have a situation where poverty and inequity continue to grow. The richest 26 people have the same amount of wealth as the poorest, 50%. And unemployment is rising. The situations that we're finding ourselves in with climate change and and COVID and the shutdown and all sorts of things are spiralling us into an economic crisis. We're seeing the worst recession since World War II and we're up to something like $250 trillion debt globally. Back in 2008, Australians had about $6,000 per person debt Uh, Now it's around 25,000. It's grown significantly. We're still clearing forests at a rate of one football field every six seconds. And 
We've lost about 46% of the forest cover on Earth since farming began, and agriculture covers about 40% of our land. Because the type of agriculture that is taking place on, on this land, we're actually losing soil incredibly. So not only are we losing soil, about one third of soil is acutely degraded on Earth. We're losing billions of tonnes of topsoil per year, and around about 50% of the soil carbon is estimated to have been released, contributing to climate change. And a recent study talked about there really only being 60 years of agriculture possible at this current pace of soil devastation. Now, attached to this too, in terms of the industrial agricultural system, we've lost over 75% the diversity of seeds. Our oceans are 26% more acidic. They're overfished. About 50% of the ocean is industrially fished. They're full of plastics and pollutants. Uh, and only 14% of the ocean area, which covers most of the globe, is still wild. Now, Fritjof Capra talks about all of these crises being connected and how that they're all connected to a crisis of perception, a perception about how we see ourselves and see ourselves in relation to nature. And Greta Thunberg recently posted this, saying, stop saying that we're all in the same boat. You know, we kind of hear this statement in in relation to COVID or in relation to climate. It goes on to say, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And this was posted, a post shared from the Extinction Rebellion site. And it's so true because the most vulnerable are far more at risk because of all of the things that are happening that I've just been talking about. And they're already feeling it. But what's happening now too is that the wealthier communities are feeling it as well. The conversations that needed to happen a long time ago are actually coming to the fore. And I don't know any other system that looks at all of the different interconnected crises and aspects of life together in a way and puts the flourishing of life at the core and designs in complexity with the context and the, the value of humanity and the planet together quite like permaculture does. It addresses all of the crises together, holistically, locally, accessibly, quietly, quite radically and regeneratively. Permaculture myceliates. It ripples out and it has been since it began. People learn permaculture and then they teach others who teach others and who ripple it out and show others and it keeps moving and it keeps moving and changing and adapting in the context. Rather than it being a fixed set, it, it moves into where it needs to go and helps to make the difference that makes a difference. So I estimate that about 1 million people have done permaculture courses around the world. But actually, the reality is it's probably way, way higher than that, um, particularly if you consider all the short courses and the, and the things that are just happening regardless and people coming into people's gardens and farms and, and learning inadvertently. And one of the really important places to be doing permaculture is in the commons, in a place where we can learn together and connect with one another, to teach each other, to share seeds, to share cuttings, to share our knowledge. And so whether it be uh, in the city or in the countryside, whether it be in schools or community gardens or parks or workplaces, this concept of bringing permaculture gardening into the commons is such an important one. And it's particularly been evident too with many of the women's groups that I'm working with in places like Kenya. This is Jane's women's group in, uh, in Kambiri in Kenya. And... She's brought together a group of women, mostly grandmothers, who connect all of the different communities around this area. And so they come together and they learn on a community farm and then they use the money that they generate through the micro enterprises there to support the setting up of community farms and education in their own villages. There's a new initiative that's emerging too, which is the Perma Youth. Now the Perma Youth have... Uh, Students have come out of the Permaculture Education Institute and talked about how they really wanted to connect with other young people around the world and also to connect with uh, a range of different elders 
within the permaculture movement and activists to to be inspired. And so we've got a range of different things that now happen with Perma Youth. One is that they have weekly meetings and they get together and they also have monthly festivals like the one that just happened recently. And they invited David Holmgren, um, the co-founder of Permaculture, Brenna Quinlan, the permaculture artist, um, Charlie McGee, the permaculture musician, and all of the young people together made films, wrote um, wrote songs, um, poetry, did garden tours, and together they are learning, together they are inspiring one another, they're connecting with elders and activists in the movement to really become educated and informed and inspired practivists who become leaders in their own community. So this is a super exciting move, movement that's reaching to young groups in refugee camps too. So the picture on, on the right-hand side is Bemariki with one of his Perma Youth groups. So he's also a student of the Permaculture Education Institute. He was offered a scholarship to attend the program. And since he started, actually from the moment he started, he started sharing it on. So he's now has uh, at least three groups of Perma Youth happening there. So Bemariki started this program in his backyard, in his in his home in Ramwanja refugee settlement in the far west of um, Uganda. And so he invites groups of young people, and this has been particularly important because of the lockdown, that young people were able to come and work with him while there was no school. So they're learning about nutrition guards and each of them get a set of tools and they not only learn how to do it, but then they take the tools and the knowledge back home and in little teams they go around and help get gardens started in their own places. And now they're also starting a community farm. So it's nutrition gardens, it's education. These young kids are actually gaining their permaculture design certificates so then they can become teachers and have possibilities of a livelihood and work and a sense of being able to have an autonomy that whether they're in the settlement wherever they get relocated to or if they can go back and re- rebuild differently. And this is Sakina Kiribar from the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya and she talks about how permaculture is the knowledge we need for a future, for hope. It's the kind of knowledge that they need to be able to transform where they are, to give possibilities of understanding and designing landscapes where they end up or to help rebuild when they go home. Sakina is about to head back to the Congo where she's originally from, the D- Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and this is a s- program that's supported through the Ethos Foundation. And thank you everyone who donated so generously to support her to teach them. The Democratic R- Republic of Congo is at the same time the richest country in the world, full of minerals and resources that are the things that are used in laptops and phones and all the trappings of wealth but at the same time it's the poorest country where people are earning on average about less than five hundred dollars a year and in extreme poverty and suffering uh, hunger in some areas 40 percent of people are on the brink of starvation so she's going back to teach permaculture She's going to start teaching teachers who will then teach teachers. And it's this idea of bringing in the resilience, resilient farming and the farming which brings greater level of abundance than the industrial farming that has destroyed their soils and destroyed the nutrition and health of the people. So thank you for everyone who's supported Sakina to go there. She leaves in just a few days. She's also teaching teachers in the refugee camp where she's currently. This is the latest group of adults that she's taught who are going out now to teach more young people and to teach people around their neighbourhood how to grow permaculture gardens, nutrition gardens. And it's a really important part of this is actually looking at how to create seed sovereignty. Vandana Shiva talks about how the beauty of the seed is that out of one you can get millions. And that that's an economics of abundance. And it's absolutely true. So I've just been harvesting all of my mustard seeds lately. And I literally have millions and millions of these seeds that have come off, things that have self-seeded. So by starting to reconfigure the way that we think about farming, the way that we rethink about our seeds, how we think about our gardens, 
and we start to think about how we can collect and share seeds to reinvigorate the, the diversity of the things that we grow and consider how we can actually create an absolute abundance by addressing seeds. Uh, currently, 75% of our food is coming from just 12 species, which is absolutely ridiculous. And we've lost 75% of our seed diversity in the last 100 years or more. And so Vandana talks about how in nature's economy, the currency isn't money, it's life and the life in the seed. She really advocates so much for the need for real food systems like permaculture. So eating anything that's not rice, wheat, corn, soy or palm oil is in fact a radical act. And reclaiming food diversity and food sovereignty is a key task of our time and focusing on 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 the seed on collecting and distributing and saving and sharing and exchanging local seed is at the core of that and so is creating resilient home gardens wherever you are whether you're in in a in an urban area or in a town or in the countryside to be surrounding yourself with resilient home gardens they're full of nutritious food they're diverse then living systems that provide habitat for you, but also for other species. And as I said before, it's a radical act. It's something so simple, but it really is radical because it brings in real security. Real security is actually found in a thriving garden because you know that at any time you can walk out and have food to eat. You can find your medicines. You can uh, find a possibility for generating an income. There's a real sense of of absolute security in having a thriving garden surrounding you. And part of this too is cultivating forest gardens or food forests. And this is the idea that supports the understanding that nature tends towards complexity. So how within your garden system can you support what nature just naturally wants to do to tend, to, tend towards this complex living system that is becomes self-supporting, it creates its own mulch and it improves its soil and creates the thriving the, the conditions for the soil to thrive and absorbs the moisture in and, and provides, like I said before, fruits and medicines and uh, uh, vegetables and herbs and flavors and spices and teas and all sorts of things for you, but is also providing all those different needs and um, functions for the ecological system itself. This draws very much on the indigenous way of thinking. And it's, in, and it's imperative at this time that we really look to indigenous knowledge and ask for help and assistance, I think, in finding our way forward. I often spend time with local elders trying to understand more about what's going on in our local area and in whatever area that I find myself in. And uh, my friend Wurunga recently said, your permaculture garden is your supermarket. You don't need a supermarket. You can find everything that you need here. And so the idea really is about embracing that and thinking first to the garden, look there for your next meal. And what you can't find or what you can't supplement or what you can't change in terms of adjusting what you're eating for the day, then you go further afield to a local store. But... This idea of embracing your permaculture garden as your supermarket, I think, is a fantastic concept. Indigenous peoples really hold the past and the future of food in their hands and understanding the plants, the seasons, regenerative practices, medicines, local abundance in the systems. Bruce Pascoe in Australia has really highlighted the fact that in order to create a food future here in Australia, we need to embrace and understand and recognise Indigenous food systems. And permaculture from the very outset has celebrated and been informed by Indigenous knowledge. Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village in France is one of those places that also embraces permaculture. We have a number of students who are part of the permaculture education program that are helping to design and set up parts of the happy farms at Plum Village uh, through permaculture principles. And they're currently in the process of that. But Thich Nhat Hanh said, you are a gardener. And you have in your hands the power to transform garbage into flowers, into fruit, into vegetables. You don't throw anything away because you're not afraid of garbage. 
Your hands are capable of transforming it into flowers or lettuce or cucumbers. And so this, this concept of circular economy, that there is no way, and that waste, if there is waste, that it can, it's part of that natural process of, of growth and decay. And, and decay is absolutely essential for growth. We know that through compost. I was recently talking to Dr. Charles Marshall, a cultural ecologist and Indigenous elder, and she was telling us about how her key priority when she's designing her food system is about gardening and farming for nature. And this is so in line exactly with what the way of thinking that underpins permaculture, that our idea is to condense our footprint so that we try and, and grow and meet, grow food and meet our needs in the smallest footprint possible, and then we protect and regenerate the rest. And in order to actually regenerate the damage that's been done, we really need to be looking at how we can put 50% back for nature. How in your garden can you create habitat for birds, for pollinators, for all life? And part of this too is enlivening the soil. You know, in each teaspoon of soil, there's, there's more living things there than there are people on the planet. 95% of our food comes from healthy, living topsoil. The topsoil is actually the most important part of our food system. But yet, as I mentioned earlier, 24 billion tonnes of fertile soil are lost every year due to erosion through tilling, through pesticides, synthetic fertilisers. And healthy soils store more than 4,000. 4,000 billion tonnes of carbon. Um, but we're eroding them so fast. And it takes time for nature to build soil. And our descendants will be paying the price for this erosion of this incredibly vital resource for, for life, for humanity too. So permaculture, one of permaculture's core goals is to enliven the soil. And when we have living soil, Everything else starts to thrive from that. An important part of actually creating thriving soils is adding organic matter. So part of the pioneer process of a permaculture system is building up organic matter, growing lots of um, fast, uh, growing fast growing things that we can then actually turn back into the soil. Because every 1% increase in organic matter in the soil can help to be like a sponge for a, around 150,000 litres per acre of water. And the organic matter is also food for the living, the living things in the soil. So increasing organic matter, helping to rehydrate the landscape, slowing down the water. So we have this, this kind of slogan, uh, which is slow it, spread it, sink it, store it with water. So how do you slow it down either by, you know, terracing or dense planting or um, swales, all different kinds of things that can help to slow down the water, spread it across the slope, sink it into the soil. So slow it down enough that it has a chance to infiltrate rather than rush off and take all the soil with it and then to store it there. And that's where the organic matter comes in. So having the rehydration of the landscape. So this is on a small garden scale. There's also people like um, Stuart Andrews and Peter Andrews who are talking about rehydrating the landscape at a broader scale. And it's this importance too of integrating, integrating the animals and the plant systems. That when we separate these two things, we create pollution in one spot and waste in another spot. So we have the pollution from the concentrated chicken farms and we have the waste uh, you know, scraps from the veg vegetables somewhere else. We have to import the nutrients and we have to export the waste. And, you know, it creates a system whereby it's out of balance, it's energy intensive, and it's destructive. So how can we bring back and reintegrate, whether it be at a small scale like this or at a larger scale on, on broader scale farms, but finding ways to think about how we can integrate the plants and the animals in our food systems. And so, you know, in order to integrate that, you'll see in this picture here um, that I have a lot of different kind of perennials and hardy, hardy plants, which mean that the chickens can actually range in my garden without doing a terrible amount of damage. 
if I have a section where I'm just getting started with some lettuces, I'll keep them out of that. But, you know, the cor the coriander and the sorrel and the leeks and the, the kales, they tend, the mature plants like this, they tend to leave alone. So I have areas where the chickens can come in and they can be part of it. They stay healthy. They get the needs, the food that they need. They help me manage pests. But it's not just the domestic animals. I actually design the garden in a way that provides habitat for the wild species to come in and to, to help me in my garden too, like the wild birds that come in and pick off pests or the, the lizards and the frogs, and they're all part of it. Now, another part that I think is really important to help us to reduce food waste, for example, is eating more of each plant. Now, any of you who've heard any of the talks that I've done before will probably hear, probably would have heard me talking about the humble pumpkin. And, and I think it's a story worth repeating because it really helps us to rethink a lot about each of the different plants that we have in our garden. Now, pumpkin, every single part of the pumpkin is edible. Often when we think of pumpkin, we just think about the orange flesh inside, but the skin is edible, the seeds inside are edible, the leaves edible, the flowers, the shoots, all of it is edible. I mean, maybe not that stalk sticking out there, but the rest of it is. And so when we think about trying to reduce food waste and to diminish our footprint, let's think about how we can actually use all the parts of the plant rather than just a particular bit. You know, think about how you can eat the leaves of broccoli or how you can eat you know, the leaves of beetroot or how you can harvest the leaves of an olive tree for tea or, you know, all of these different things. I've filled my YouTube channel full of different tips about all the different ways that you can eat plants because I think this is a core part. This shift of eating more of each plant is key to addressing the, the situation that we face now. And in order to do that, we actually need to bring our gardens closer. Because when, we're, when we go to the store, all we ever see is the pumpkin and often, you know, chopped up and wrapped in plastic. Whereas when we're at home and growing pumpkins or when they're growing in our community garden or in the verge or in a vertical garden, a rooftop garden somewhere, we get to access all those different parts of the plant. And so in actual fact, you know, many times they talk about food waste being you know, about a third to a half of the food that's grown is wasted. I would hazard a guess to say that it would be closer to 90% of the food that's grown is wasted because we don't eat all of the parts of the plants. We only eat a particular part and only call that bit food, whereas all of its food. There's well over 30,000 different varieties of edible plants in the world, and yet we rely on so few and we eat so little of each of them. And in order, too, of thinking differently about the types of plants we grow we struggle to grow a certain range of you know carrots and tomatoes and broccolis and lettuces whereas there's so many other things that we could be growing so in my garden for example I have an edible canna instead of a potato which in the subtropics is it's a much easier plant to grow uh, to forgetting a potato like type of thing and it's there all the time um, you know I find it challenging to grow things like garlic most of the time so I have society garlic, which gives me the chance to have garlic in any meal that I want. The flowers are edible as well as the straps, and they're there all year round, and they're hardy. Uh, same thing with the type of different sort of leafy greens that I select. I have an abundance of different types of things that I call spinach loosely, and it doesn't really matter which one you have. They all have that spinach quality. And so these are resilient and hardy foods. And they're also disaster resilient. So if there's a flood or if there's a cyclone, a lot of these plants are actually really very hardy. So I'd like to ask you to think about what are the hardy foods that are in your area that perhaps you've overlooked or maybe thought, oh, I don't really want to eat those. I'd rather just grow these to give them another chance and to think of them through this perspective about creating easy abundance that's there in your garden all year round or as, as long as your season allows and that are really hardy and capable of withstanding all different things that don't need to be really you know pampered you know you can stick those things in and amongst this structure of having a really robust garden but make the bulk of your garden robust and so as well as doing your own garden I think a really central 
task is to create, as I said earlier, more common gardens, spaces where people are learning and growing together and growing community at the same time. So sharing skills, sharing resources, sharing land, um, sharing food. You know, someone might grow a little bit more of something in their little plot and, and share it with someone else. Um, it's a way of accessing more land, more skill, more knowledge, more capability and supporting people who are vulnerable or may not actually have um, the capability to grow quite as much as you do. And it's also a way of empowering people. This is Mariam Issa, a, a wonderful friend of mine who lives in Melbourne. Originally, she was a refugee from Somalia and she landed in Melbourne about 20 years ago. And she started in her backyard a community garden as a place where people can share food and share stories and find themselves and find their community and learn basic skills about how to grow food, um, how to prepare different types of food and to deepen their connection and their uh, with their own culture, but also with other people's culture. And through that, creating a sense of of peace because we have a deeper understanding when we understand other people's cultures and perspectives and hear their stories. So Mariam is doing an amazing um, project called the Raw Garden. And you can find, you can listen to her story more on, on my podcast, actually. I, she was one of my first guests. Uh, so you can find her there. It's Sense Making in a Changing World. I'll put the link in, in, the, in the chat or down below. So I think this idea of, of using permaculture as a platform for teaching in all different ways, whether it be in your backyard like Marion, whether it be like Sakina heading back into the Democratic Republic of Congo, or whether it be like Bemariki teaching children in, in his yard. Um, I open up my garden too for, for kids programs or for high school student programs for tours, all sorts of things. What is it that you can do in your garden to create a place where people can come and learn and be inspired and, and learn the, the practical skills and, and uh, maybe go away with a, a bundle load of cuttings that they can get their own garden start with? Maybe it's your front yard or your community garden, your school garden. Where are the places that you can start to share and teach permaculture through this practical lens? Uh, so it's so positive and purposeful. And I know that during COVID, this has been a really challenging thing, but actually during COVID, permaculture has flourished, absolutely flourished, because people have started to recognize the need for this type of thing more, that this, their skills and knowledge in this have, are really not quite where they need to be. And that there is so much potential within there too, to not only share it as a community service or as something with your children and with your neighborhood children, but it's also something you can do as a livelihood. And this has been a really important step too, to reconsider what it is that we do with our time and our life. And particularly now when unemployment has started to skyrocket, when people's work has changed so much and people are so much more home-based. What can you do from your home and your community that helps to transform and make an impact on those cascading crises that I mentioned right at the very beginning? And a part of this looking at what's happening to the changing changes in our lives with, with COVID, a pandemic gardening study has recently been conducted and one of the comments that was that, that there is a future when you garden. This is a study that was led by Dr. Nick Rose of Sustain Australia. And you'll find uh, also on the podcast, I just recently did an interview with him and you can hear a lot more about, <clears throat> about this study and also about the findings. And just to mention a couple of those things, they had 9,000 respondents to this survey within a month. And it was supported by people like Costa and the Diggers Club. Now, 98% of the people who were gardening or started gardening in the pandemic have said that they're going to continue, that there's been a shift. There's a cultural shift that's happened and a recognition of the importance of gardening. And 19% of people who responded to this survey said that gardening was essential, that it was actually what kept them going. Um, both economically and emotionally and mentally too. 
So this idea that gardening is more than just the food and it's more than just, you know, even making money in your garden. It is actually about the balance and the peace that you find when you have this greater level of of security and the opportunity to connect on a daily basis with plants and to be doing something that grows an abundance and thrives. So we are in an economic downturn right now and I think the work of Kate Rayworth with her her theory around donut economics is something that we that is so timely and is absolutely necessary to look at right now. So I just want to explain this diagram here. So essentially Kate talks about how there's this sweet spot and that's the donut shape. If the economics is less than this sweet spot, you have a shortfall where there is not enough for people to thrive. If you overshoot this sweet spot, you overshoot the the ecological ceiling and that's where you get all these things like climate change, ocean acidification, pollution, uh, you know, the loss of diversity, all of those things happen. So it's about trying to find this safe and just space for, for humanity where we can regenerate and we regenerate the ecological system and create a socially just foundation for all people to thrive and for life to thrive too. So this is the kind of economic system that underpins how we think about economics in permaculture. And, and so Kate, as someone from Oxford University, talks about the bigger picture and looks at how whole countries and whole regions can transform the economic system. There's people like Emma, Kate and Rob who are looking at how to transform the food economy at a more local level. What you do locally is not a small thing. Everything's nested within everything else. And if you can create the most amazing local example, it myceliates. So this is what's happening with Food Connect and the work of Emma, Kate Rose and Rob Pekin. They've created Food Connect, which is a local place that connects with farmers all around that local area and distributes it within the local community. But what's important in this, it's not just a CSA model. They've created local food hubs, which has a a range of of different type of food enterprises altogether, underpinned by uh, indigenous perspective that, and also a different kind of economic model whereby the community owns this space and the Instead of having shareholders, they have careholders. So I'm really proud and honoured to be a careholder of this local food enterprise hub. And so there's different ways of applying permaculture. I think is what I'm trying to say here is that whether you are looking at a garden in your backyard or whether you're looking at redesigning the type of work that you do, or if you're looking at um, creating community enterprises or community projects, that taking the permaculture thinking of earth care, people care and fair share, then they apply to all of these things. And you can find out more about the Food Connect story as well if you, um, again, head over to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast because one of my recent interviews too was with Emma Kate. And so permaculture faces biodiversity lost, forest clearing, climate change, soil loss, bushfires, floods, pandemic, the economy, unemployment, inequity, poverty, hunger and depression. It faces all of these things and it focuses on what it is that we can actually do to make a a change, a positive change wherever we are about this. It doesn't ignore all of these things. It of course can't solve all of those problems simultaneously but it faces that and that we design and we create the conditions for life, for all life to thrive and regenerate. So one of the simplest ways that we can actually face the crises in a way that is purposeful for us personally is to grow and eat for the well-being of people on the planet, to find the best way that we can have low embodied energy and water in our food, low waste, but it's also nutrient dense for us and regenerative for the planet. And so it you know, really what we could say is that permaculture is about one planet living. You know, we're currently living, if everyone in the world lived like the typical Australian, we would need four Earths, 
<laughs> we only have one. And so permaculture is about how can we reduce our footprint on this planet by, you know, 80% in order that we can live within this, live within the ecological boundaries and not just live, not just survive, but thrive. And not just wealthier communities, but all communities. So coming back to explore what is permaculture in a changing world? Well, we focus in on enlivening our soil, growing where you are, eating locally, collecting and sharing seeds, learning every day to share your knowledge and to myceliate your permaculture knowledge and to connect with nature, to connect with yourself, to connect with enterprises, to connect your knowledge into whichever aspect of life that you are working. So whether it be your work, your education, your family, how you how you build, how you do volunteering, all of these things to be taking in these the idea of earth care, people care and fair share, to face and acknowledge the crises that are upon us and to find very practical and positive ways to connect and move forward that brings us all forward in a way that we can thrive. And so I've mentioned a few things along the way that I just wanted to give you the links for because um, I have a YouTube channel where there's well over 200 different films that talk about all the really practical things that you can do in your gardens. Um, but it also, this YouTube channel also includes um, uh, the videos of all the, the podcasts as well as interviews with interesting people and garden tours um, and also previous masterclasses as well. So check this out. Um, you'll find it on YouTube. Just look up Moray Gamble, Our Permaculture Life, and you'll find a whole series there. The Ethos Foundation is the permaculture charity that I've mentioned a number of times here. And this is, um, you can find that at ethosfoundation.org.au. And there there's a, a, a donation button. And I, I welcome and I'm so grateful for any donations. And I want to thank everyone who's responded recently to the calls for your support. We don't get funding from anyone else. It is simply through your generosity that these programs are funded. And 100% of the donations that come into the Ethos Foundation go directly to the local communities that we're working with. And we work with people that we know. And so it's people like Sakina and, and Bemariki and Jane, who I have a personal connection with and I, and I know the work they're doing. So we, we get to, um, you know, it's not about having a grant program and people applying. It's about people like Sakina saying, look, this is what we really need to do here. This is, this is what's happening on the ground. They inform us about what they need and then we find the, the resources to support them. So it's kind of like a flipped model. And it's not like saying, okay, we'll have a grant and we'll provide you with half of what you're asking for. You know, often we're saying, well, is that enough? Is that going to get you what, you know, is that going to help you to do the work that you need to do? And so some of the things that we're currently working on getting more support with is helping to get more um, programs for young people. So now that we have more Perma Youth teachers, uh, we, we're going to have a new flush of, of Perma Youth members. So around $35 each new Perma Youth member helps them to get their own set of tools and seeds they can, um, and also to come in and learn permaculture and then go back into their gardens to teach it. And also $150 is what's needed to teach a new Perma Youth teacher. And when I say that, it's also someone who can go and teach adults as well and, and ripple out the work. But the focus that we've got um, currently is really around getting more Perma Youth because particularly in these refugee camps, you know, over 50% of the people are under 18. I wanted to also point you to my blog where you can find um, hundreds of articles and links to pretty much all the work that I do here. So that's our permaculture life. And if you're interested in a, an on, a permaculture gardening course, I have this online course which goes through all of these modules. You can see them on this beautiful sign that my friend painted. So about creating soils, how to set up your garden, um, growing abundant food, setting up a food forest, superfoods, medicinals, the beauty garden, like what can you use in your hair and your face instead of buying all those other products? Um, what are the things you can grow for teas and, 
and looking differently about the different kinds of things that you can eat from your garden. So that's the, it's called the Incredible Edible Garden course and you can find it at this link. And also um, there is, like I mentioned on the YouTube channel, I've put up the previous masterclasses um, up there. So I'm wondering whether you were able to catch some of these previous ones about creating thriving thriving neighborhoods, um, the lessons I've learned through eco villages or setting up community garden was the last one. Um, really diving into the permaculture kitchen garden um, at the start of the COVID lockdown and, and looking differently about how we can apply the global sustainability goals um, from a permaculture perspective. So they're all available on the YouTube as well. And the podcast that I've mentioned many times uh, throughout the throughout this session uh, is Sense Making in a Changing World, which is a weekly podcast where I interview people that are doing amazing things or mentors who have inspired me and conversations that I really want to share with you because I think going deeper into the, the, the backstory, into the ideas behind all of this is a really important thing to support us in the practical actioning so that we're actually heading off in the action in the right direction and that we're really seeing where the change needs to happen and how we can create the conditions to create um, a thriving future. So just again, um, the, some of the links. Uh, the Permaculture Education Institute is where you'll find out about all of the, um, the Permaculture Educators Program, which is my Permaculture Design Certificate course and Permaculture Teachers Certificate course plus biz, business modules. And that's at Permaculture Education Institute. Uh, so we now have people on six continents studying together uh, through this online program. And as you can see, it's not just it's not just online watching videos. It's actually connecting globally with people doing amazing things everywhere. And we have regular conversations where people can get together and talk with one another and hear about these, um, you know, and be inspired by what each other are doing. Uh, so, and then the way you can find out the newsletter, blog, and YouTube, um, check out our permaculture life and the charity is ethosfoundation.org.au. So thank you so much for joining me today for this masterclass on exploring what is permaculture in a changing world. And uh, those of you who are here live with me today, um, please stay around because I'll be here available in the chat and we can continue to talk for the next 15 minutes or so. Thank you again, everyone. And it's been lovely to have your company. I really enjoy these sessions with you and I look forward to the conversations that will emerge. Take care, stay safe. Bye.